You were not born to tend the grave. Man, you've been called by name, raised to life again. Isn't that good news this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, uh, hey, if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, I want to encourage you to turn in them with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and while you're looking for that, uh, let me tell you why we have such a strong conviction each and every week to to point you to uh, the Word of God. Uh, we believe that the Word of God is the living, uh, breathing, inspired truth of God, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it contains everything that you and I need to know about salvation and how to live in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. And what that means is that nothing that we say up here uh, on a weekly basis amounts to anything if it is not rooted and anchored in his word, right? And another thing it means is that any given Sunday, the preacher standing up here could be boring, not today, (laughs) but any other Sunday, they could be uh, boring or not connecting with you, but if you stay focused in the word of God, God could still radically change your life that day and it have absolutely nothing to do with the preacher because it doesn't have anything to do with the preacher. It has everything to do with the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and a loving God who desperately wants you to encounter him today. Amen? Amen. So if you have your Bibles... And I hope you do turn to Ephesians chapter 2, whether it's in your device or in that old-fashioned thing with pages that you flip and turn. Well, over the past couple of weeks, we've been in a series walking through the book of Ephesians and, and taking a look at our true identity in Christ. In week one, Pastor Mike, he, he helped us to look at how we are, are called and invited to become children of God Uh, and we are created in the image of that God. And then last week, we looked at how he's inviting into this identity of calling ourselves blessed, that we can live in this reality of God's blessing. And today, my assignment is to talk to you about our identity as individuals who are saved by the amazing grace of God. Uh, Turn to your neighbor and say, we're about to get saved. Okay, so that's what we're talking about today. And uh, there's an old saying in preaching that goes like this, before you can get someone saved, you have to get them lost. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time getting lost together uh, in this message this morning. And so let me begin by asking you, have you ever been lost before? Uh, Now, I I don't mean you made a wrong turn on the way to Walmart kind of lost. I I, I mean like you, you are lost and you have no idea where you are. Well, you may not know this about me, but getting lost is one of my special abilities. Uh, My wife can testify to this after 32 years of marriage. I have this unique gift. Uh, But eons ago, when I was 17 years old, uh, already living out on my own, my parents had moved to central Missouri near Lake of the Ozarks, and I was going to take a trip to see them. It's about a two-hour drive from Springfield uh, up to there, and uh, I jumped in my 1978 Chevy C10 Scottsdale pickup, it sounds a whole lot better than it was, and I headed north. And I spent 12 to 16, I, I arrived safely, I spent about 12 to 16 hours at my parents' house, and for multiple reasons, I decided, you know what, that's kind of enough, enough time at my mom and dad's. And uh, late Saturday afternoon, I jumped back in my truck and headed home. Well, after driving for a while, I began to think to myself, man, none of this stuff looks familiar. Uh, now, keep in mind, this was before the days when everybody had a cell phone or even MapQuest. Uh, some of you don't even know what MapQuest is. Uh, Google it. Um, I, w- I was dependent on maps and my wonderful sense of direction, and who needs maps anyway? And so I kept driving, becoming increasingly concerned that I was going the wrong direction, until on the horizon I, I saw this. I saw this magnificent building off over the horizon. It's the Missouri Capitol Building in Jefferson City, Missouri. Have you been there? Of course not, because you have no reason to go there, and neither did I. (laughs) 
I was lost and headed in the wrong direction. Lost is one of the metaphors that the Bible uses to describe our spiritual condition apart from Christ. Lost, headed in the wrong direction. But in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says it's actually much worse. In Ephesians chapter 2, he, he writes and he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Notice how Paul doesn't pull any punches here. Uh, he says, as a result of your sin, you were dead. Not sick, not wounded, not struggling and need a little help. D-E-A-D, -E spiritually dead. You see, the reality of your situation and mine apart from Christ is that sin has left us spiritually dead and separated from God, the source of life and living. This is our spiritual condition as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. The question is, how did we get this way? Well, Scripture tells us that in the beginning, a creator God created all that there is and said, it is good. And so in the beginning, you and I, hum humanity, are in perfect harmony with God, in perfect harmony with, with one another. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, everything broke, and I mean everything. In one moment of rebellion, they unleashed death, physical and spiritual death into the perfect world that God had made. And here's the thing, it wasn't just some minor slip up or a little mistake, no, it was cosmic treason. They weren't just breaking a rule, they were breaking the very order of creation, fracturing the relationship between humanity and God. And the Bible tells us that in that moment that they ate from the tree, their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked. Think about that for just a moment. For the first time ever, they felt shame. They felt exposed. They felt the crushing weight of guilt. Prior to that, up until that moment, they had only known goodness. No evil no shame, no guilt. They lived in perfect harmony with God, with each other, and with creation. But with one bite, all of that came crashing down, and their souls and their bodies began to die right then and there. And they didn't just learn the difference in that moment between good and evil. They experienced evil for the first time. They, they felt the sting of it deep in their souls. And that's been the human experience ever since. Sin doesn't just wound, it kills. It severs us from the life that we were made for, both in this world and the next. And from that moment on, death became our inheritance. And if that wasn't bad enough, Paul then goes on and gives us a glimpse into the reality that there are three enemies, listen to me, three enemies in this fallen world that are continually conspiring against our souls to keep us enslaved, uh, to keep us trapped in a way of life that leads to more and more death, even as we chase uh, things that we think will bring us life. So in order to understand the power of the gospel this morning, I want us to first understand the depth of our lostness without it. In Ephesians 2, Paul talks about these three enemies of the souls. He says, uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Uh, and if that wasn't bad enough, he says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them who to all formerly lived in the lusts of your flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Paul, he talks about these three enemies of the soul conspiring against us. He says the first one is the world. Paul starts by saying that before Christ, we, we walked according to the course of this world. And, and here's the thing. When, when Paul talks about the world, he's not talking about just the planet or humanity. He's talking about the system of values, ideologies, and cultural practices all around us that are in direct rebellion against God's kingdom. It's a culture that constantly whispers lies to us about what will make us happy. It's the endless pursuit of pleasure, materialism, and ambition. You see, the world tells us, man, if you just get enough, achieve enough, experience enough, you'll finally feel alive. But here's the the brutal irony. The more we chase these things, the emptier we become. We run after pleasure thinking, It will fill the void in our hearts, but all it does is leave us craving more. We accumulate more stuff, more money, more success, more status, but it it never satisfies. In fact, the more we get, the deeper our sense of dissatisfaction. We think ambition will, will give us purpose and meaning, but instead it wears us out, burns us out, and leaves us feeling more dead inside than before. See, this is the curse of the world, a way of life that promises freedom and fulfillment but delivers slavery and emptiness. It's a system designed to make us feel like we're in control, but really it's controlling us. And apart from Christ, we, we were all following this course, dead in our pursuit of a life that can never truly satisfy. But then says Paul says, if if a broken, fallen world isn't bad enough. There's this thing called, or this person called the devil. Paul says that we were also walking according to the prince of the power of the air. That is a, a term or phrase that refers to the devil. Now, now, I know that we are enlightened modern Americans, but let's not dismiss this as some outdated superstition. You see, Satan is real. Uh, he's not some figure in red tights and a pitchfork. He's a, a real enemy, and his primary strategy is deception. In fact, Jesus calls him the father of lies. And that's exactly how he operates. He doesn't come at us with obvious, blatant evil most of the time. No, he comes at us with subtle lies that seem almost true. And the devil whispers things to us like, man, you know you deserve this. Or it's really not that big of a deal. Or God's holding out on you. You see, he, he twists the truth just enough to make sin, sin seem like the better option. And here's the thing, he's really good at it. And before we meet Jesus, we don't even realize we're following the devil. We're just living our lives, making decisions, and going about our business, all the while being led down a path that leads to destruction. Before Christ, we weren't just victims of circumstances. We were actively following the devil's lies, even if we didn't realize it. And then finally, Paul points us, to our flesh. He says, we lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. You see, the word Paul uses for flesh there in the Greek is the word sarx, and it refers to our fallen, sinful nature. And what Paul wants us to understand is that sin isn't just out there But sin is in here as well. That sin is not just something we do. It's a part of who we are deep down. We inherit this broken nature from Adam. And it affects every 
part of our being, our thoughts, our desires, and our actions. In fact, theologian Charles Spurgeon said that as as salt flavors every drop in the Atlantic, so does sin affect every atom of our nature. It is so sadly there, so abundantly there, that if you cannot detect it, you are deceived. And you see this, this fallen, sinful nature it often manifests itself in what theologians refer to as generational sin. Think of it like family heirlooms that we never asked for. Family heirlooms like fears, trauma, even sins echoing through generations. In Exodus chapter 20, we read of the iniquities of the fathers being visited upon their children to the third and fourth generations. And and this has baffled us. uh, Even at the same time, for many of us, it hits so close to home. Like, we can feel the weight of that. And what is fascinating is that science is now giving us a, a glimpse into how this happens, not just spiritually, but biologically. Uh, In a recent study from Emory University, uh, researchers conditioned male mice to fear the smell of cherry blossoms by pairing the scent with mild electric shocks. And so they would introduce the sweet smell of cherry blossoms and then shock them. And then these mice now carried a learned fear, uh, were taken and bred with females And their offspring, who had never experienced the cherry blossom smell or the shock, showed the same fear. They were biologically predisposed to react to something they had never encountered. Let that sink in for a second. The trauma, the fear... And the response was passed down, not by teaching or environment, by something happening deep in their genetic makeup. Uh, This process called epigenetics shows that trauma and fear can leave an indelible mark on our DNA, affecting how future generations respond to the world around them. I, I wonder this morning, does this sound familiar? Well, it should because this is generational sin at a biological level. It's what scripture has been warning us about for centuries. And it's not just trauma or fear. It's patterns of sin, addiction, anger, pride, passed down like family heirlooms, shaping us in ways that we didn't even realize. And here's the reality, these three enemies of the soul, the the world, the the devil, and our flesh are continually conspiring against us, and we are stuck. I mean, we are enslaved, and the truth is, we can't rescue ourselves from this mess. We are, as Paul says, dead in our sins, spiritually lifeless, incapable of saving ourselves. And left to ourselves, we are on a path that only leads to death. But God. But God. The two most beautiful words in all of Scripture penned by the Apostle Paul here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 where he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which he, ha- he loved us, he, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know what you thought about God before walking in here today, but he 
is a God who is rich in mercy. Meaning he, that he is overflowing with compassion and, and kindness towards you, and especially, especially in regards to sin, weakness, and, and brokenness. That, that he isn't repelled by your mess. He is rich in mercy. Why? Well, Paul says it's because of his great love with which he has loved us even when even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins. The fact of the matter is, he loves you with an everlasting love. I I mean, listen to me, he doesn't just uh, like you or tolerate you on your good days. He's crazy about you. I think of it the way that I love my kids. And especially my grandkids. <laughs> and there's absolutely nothing that they could do that would ever change the way that I feel about them. I love them with an everlasting love. And do you know that that is the way that, that, that our God feels about you today. He loves you with an everlasting love. And when you were dead in your transgressions and sins because of his great love for you, Paul says that he made you alive together with Christ. You see, this is the good news of the gospel that when we were dead, God made us alive. When we were enslaved, he set us free. When we were sucked into the vortex of the world and the devil and the flesh, he intervened through Jesus and brought us back to life. Amen? This is the power of the gospel. And one of the things that you, you need to hear today is that it's, it's not about cleaning yourself up or trying harder in order to please God. It's about realizing that you are dead and trusting the one who can bring you back to life. You see, in Christ, we are no longer defined by the course of this world, the lies of the devil, or the desires of the flesh. We've been made new, raised up with Christ to walk in a new way of life. That's the beauty of grace. And that's the point that Paul is is driving home here. He says it in verse 5, and then he repeats it again in verse 8. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one can boast. You see, Paul knew all too well our human tendency to try to earn our salvation. He, he was a Jew, and in his days, uh, they had meticulously organized their pursuit of salvation around 613 do's and don'ts. You thought the Ten Commandments was bad. Like they had 613 boxes that they, that they tirelessly tried to check. You see, Paul understood that as human beings, we have this deeply ingrained tendency to try to save ourselves through self-effort and self-actualization. And when it comes to self-effort, we think that, man, if I can just work hard enough, be good enough, check all the right religious boxes like attending church faithfully, uh, getting baptized at just the right time, getting confirmed and following all the rules that I can somehow save myself. But I'm here to tell you that there aren't enough waters to be baptized in and there aren't enough confirmation classes for you to go to through which you can save yourself. It is by grace you are saved. And when we try to to check all of the religious boxes, when we try through our own effort to save ourselves, the more we will realize that our effort doesn't get us anywhere. It's a hamster wheel of performance and self-righteousness, and all it does is leave us exhausted. And then there's our attempts at salvation through self-actualization. 
we hear messages like, well, you just need to find yourself or, or you just need to, to live your truth or become the best version of you. And the focus is on self-discovery and self-improvement. And we think, man, if I can just dig deep enough and uncover the root of my issues or optimize my habits, I'll finally find the fulfillment I'm looking for. And we may go to counseling thinking that if we can just understand ourselves better, our, our childhood, our traumas, our thought patterns, then finally we will be whole. But listen to me. While therapy can bring insight and healing, it cannot address the deeper spiritual problem at the heart of our brokenness. We need a Savior. We need a Savior. And the beauty of the gospel is that we don't have to save ourselves through self-effort or self-actualization because we can't. And the harder we try, the more we realize our inability to achieve salvation on our own. This is where grace steps in. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I don't know what you came in here expecting today. But I can tell you that God preordained this day because he's after your heart. He's here today wanting to tell you that it's time to, to lay down your striving to lay down your self-effort and trying to become the best version of you and finally come to the place and the point where you recognize that the only thing that's going to rescue from, from sin and, and death is a Savior. And you've heard the gospel today. You've heard the message of Jesus who came to rescue us from sin, death, and the brokenness, that we can't fix ourselves on our own. But for some of you, this picture of before Christ, it doesn't describe your past, it describes your present. You're sitting here and you know deep down that you haven't experienced the life that Jesus offers. You've heard about it maybe even been around it, but you haven't stepped into it. You're still stuck in your before. You're still carrying the weight of your sin, the emptiness of trying to fill your soul with things that will only leave you more hollow and more exhausted. You're still living in that reality, separated from the God who loves you more than you could ever imagine. But listen to me. It doesn't have to stay that way. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus stepped into your story so he could rewrite it. He took your sin, your shame, your guilt, everything that separates you from God, and he nailed it to the cross. And then he walked out of the grave so that you could walk into new life. And that's not just for the person sitting next to you. It's for you. Right here. Right now. Today. So the question is, will you continue to live in the before? Or will you surrender to Jesus and let him bring you into the after? Will you keep carrying the weight of your sin or will you give it to the one who already carried it for you? See, today is the day. I beg you, encourage you, don't leave this place without receiving the gift of salvation that's being offered to you. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart, knocking, ready to make you alive. 
And all you have to do is open the door and say, yes, Jesus, I need you. I believe that you died for me and I surrender my life to you. And if that's you today, then don't wait. Respond to his call and step out of the before and into the new reality that only Jesus can give. And so in this moment, I'm just going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. There's nothing magical or overly spiritual about bowing your head or closing your eyes. It's just an opportunity for you to block out the distractions and focus on what it is that God, the God of the universe, is saying to you right now in this moment. And if you feel that over the course of this service, man, that the, that the Holy Spirit, that God has been speaking to your heart and drawing you to step from death and into life, to step out of, of slavery and into freedom, to step into the new life that he's offering you today, would you just raise your hand? There's hands already raised. Just raise your hand and say, Jesus, I need you today. I see those hands all around the auditorium today. Anybody else, just raise it high so I can see it, especially in the back. I see those hands. I see those hands. Now with heads, bows, and eyes closed, I'm just going to invite you to repeat this prayer after me. It's just a simple prayer. Just speak it in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say it in your heart. Say, yes, Jesus, I need you. I believe you died for me and I surrender my life to you. Please forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me from all my wrongs. I turn away from my old life and I put my trust in you alone. I ask you to come into my heart and make me alive in Christ. Transform me by your grace and lead me in a new way of life. here's what I believe. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, I believe that that God has received you into his family. You're a child of God. He's wiped the slate clean and today's a brand new day for you to walk in him and discover a new life in him. So I'm just going to ask you to do one more thing for me. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Just one more quick thing I'm going to ask you to do. If you prayed that prayer today, I'm going to ask you to to tell somebody and you can come and tell me or you can tell a member of our our prayer team that'll be at the front or outside those doors as you exit today but tell somebody if if maybe that feels awkward to you you want to you can tell us digitally you can scan the QR code on the seat in front of you there there's going to be a little header there that says I want to follow Jesus you can tell us that way. And that's so important today for you to tell somebody because we want to, we want to follow up with you. We want to help you on your, your journey. We want to provide you with not only prayer, but resources and next steps and learning what it truly means to follow after Jesus. You shouldn't have to walk this journey alone. Well, I'm going to pray and I'm going to, I'm going to invite you guys to stand as I pray. And then we're going to sing. Can we just celebrate all the salvations throughout the room today? Yeah. Jesus, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for being, thank you for being a God who saves. And thank you for being a Savior who is willing to lay down your life for our sins. Father, every one of us who have experienced your amazing grace today, have reason to rejoice, we have reason to shout. So Father, we're going to sing and we're going to celebrate today the salvation that we have in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.